afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another version of Learning at Home University. We are joined today by our host, Dr. Suzanne Newell, to get us started. Dr. Newell, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be back with you again today. Um, this is the second in our series of Parent University webinars. And the, the reason we decided to do this is that um, certainly there's not a training program for teachers or for parents in terms of how to live as uh, remote educational teachers right now. And um, so last week, we sent a survey out to GCIC families and asked for your questions and your input and the guidance you needed. And we took those questions and categorized them into topics that we thought would be really helpful for a parent university video series. So this week, we're really focusing on setting up learning environments for either elementary or secondary students. Tuesday's session was on elementary students, and it's archived on the um, parent university part of the GCISD website. Um, so if you missed that and you have elementary students, you want to go back in and see some age appropriate things. We had a, a guest speaker who's a kindergarten teacher, one that was a second grade teacher and one that was a fourth grade teacher. So we um, kind of covered a lot of bases there. Um, but today we're focusing on secondary um, home learning environments and motivating a kindergartner is one thing. Motivating an, an eighth grader or a 10th grader um, is an entirely different situation. And so we've got a couple of teachers with us today. Um, I'll introduce you to them in just a minute. And the goal during this session will be for parents and audience members to walk away with some tips or at least some different ways of thinking about how life is going and how to organize a good learning environment for your student at home. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen. And we will get started. All right. Lisa and Terry, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my screen? Awesome. Okay, if you can see it, I'm going to assume that the parent, parents at home can see it as well. So I'm going to walk through the slides like this, and these will be posted to the parent university part of the website at the end of our uh, show as well. Give us a couple of hours probably to do that. And we'll also have a version that is translatable into multiple languages. And so if you know somebody who would benefit from this, but they don't speak English, we'll have an opportunity for that to happen as well. Um, so the three focus questions for today's university are, and factors contributing to a productive home learning environment, establishing routines and time management. I think that it really is really the most critical part of it and expectations for independent versus dependent learning. How much involvement should a parent have? What kind of accountability or check in should they be doing? That sorts of things, uh, those sorts of things. So my um, co presenters today are Mrs. Terry Pop. She is a sixth grade English language arts teacher and an avid teacher at Cross Timbers Middle School, and Lisa Chain, who is an AP Physics 1 teacher, and she also teaches AVID 3 and 4 at Grapevine High School. And um, both of them also happen to be AVID site coordinators um, in their respective schools. And so through that work, as well as through their ordinary coursework, um, they definitely have a lot of great perspective to share for us today. So I'm going to ask Terry to begin, kind of jump in and tell us what has been and maybe your biggest celebration and your biggest challenge to life as a remote learning teacher over the course of the last month or so. Okay, well, um, this has definitely um, challenged me. There's no question about that, but it's all in a good way. Um, ironically, I always thought I was a very organized person. So organization has been my ultimate challenge throughout this whole process. As a teacher behind the scenes, we have a number of PLCs that we have to attend at different times. We have um, student appointments, we have student meetings at, at Cross Timbers, we have Wolf Time Live four days a week. And I realized that I was starting to miss some of those. Uh, I was totally confused for two weeks, but through a lot of problem solving, I bought myself this really big calendar and I'm able to look at it every day and have everything done. And I literally look at it the day before and I um, input things the week, two weeks after. So um, it, it just makes more sense to me. I'm not a digital calendar, I'm a paper person. And so that has been a huge celebration for me. Um, <laughs> uh, excuse me, one of my challenges. Um, celebrations are your children. Uh, every week we have more and more kids logging on. And one thing that has been a recurrent theme for me has been, when are we gonna come back to school? I don't, I don't like this kind of learning. I miss my friends, I miss my teachers, I miss, I miss going to Cross Timbers, I miss being a wolf. 
So what that tells me as a teacher is we're doing something right on our campus. Um, we're building a culture of relationships. Kids are craving it. They're engaging in our wolf time lives because they want that interaction. And um, I think that's a big part about stimulating that learning for students. It's a great trend to see that they're participating more and more. Um, I feel like that some of them are probably worried that that trend would go the opposite direction. Uh, the further away kids came, uh, the further away kids were from the face to face environment. And so the fact that you're getting greater participation now, maybe than you even were at first is to me a really good sign. Um, Ms. Chain, would you talk to us a little bit about your uh, biggest celebration and your biggest challenge so far in this situation? Yes, yeah, so I've experienced very similar things that uh, Terry did. Um, I know this probably seems like a little bit of a silly celebration, but um, because we are communicating with our kids on WebEx, um, I've gotten to meet a lot of pets of my students, <laughs> and I have really enjoyed that um, and just seeing how they interact with their pets. So I feel like it's something that I wouldn't normally get to see in the classroom. Um, so I, I really enjoyed, um, even though I would much prefer to be in the classroom as my students would, uh, it's nice to be able to see them in a, in a different environment and for them to share those things. So um, that's my celebration. I would say that my uh, biggest challenge right now is um, I have a senior uh, at Grapevine High School. So that presents a lot of challenges with uh, learning from home, um, that little affliction uh, is real called senioritis, uh, <laughs> you know, making decisions about, you know, where to go to college. So that's been, you know, that's, so at home I've had that, but then I also teach seniors. So um, it's also, that's also been very difficult as well. Um, not being with them, it was very, very critical time of, you know, ending one chapter and starting another chapter. So I would say that's been my biggest challenge is really meeting all of our students' needs, but the seniors in particular have a, a different set of circumstances they're dealing with. I can completely relate to that. I have a senior at my house too, and um, I've probably been guilty of spoiling her a little bit more last month than I might have normally just because I just feel, I feel for uh, her during all this situation as well. Um, all right, so and speaking of um, you're getting to meet the pets, I hope you don't get to meet mine, but, but I have two cats that are very friendly, so we might get to meet them at some point during today's slideshow. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the parent university process and expectations. I always uh, lead off with this because it's important to sort of frame the advice that we're giving. Um, because we obviously are not interacting directly with all of the uh, participants who are watching the webinar, um, we have to keep our advice pretty general, pretty generic on the focus topics. Um, if you have specific questions about a teacher or a student, um, something that's specific, please don't hesitate um, to communicate that directly to the teacher or someone at the campus. Um, we have the opportunity for participants to use the WebEx chat feature um, to submit questions that are appropriate for a wider audience, or if you just want to um, throw a pat on the back to the teachers or anything like that, we'll be able to see that. I can't see it on the screen, but Mr. Berger, our Chief Technology Officer, who's kind of moderating behind the scenes, is, is sharing those with us, and we'll answer some of the questions that might be um, brought forward. At, we'll save a little bit of time for that at the end. And one of the other things that we really have to keep in mind, and this has probably been one of our, if I were to say, one of my greatest challenges during all of this is the level of variability across the districts in terms of families' home situations. Um, there is not a one size fits all anything and a lot of the things that we could kind of um, assume were guarantees in terms of kids showing up and giving us their attention and availability to Wi-Fi and time, those constants are no longer um, the same from one household to the next. And so we have tried to um, continue offering really high quality learning experiences, but we also know that there's no one answer that fits every family's situation. And we're providing, trying to provide as much flexibility and grace with that as possible. So speakers are going to be mindful of that. And I just want the audience to make sure that they understand that that's a part of um, kind of our context. Um, so we're going to jump right on in to Ms. Pop, um, who is going to, she's got, I think, three slides. Um, and they're all organized around particular topics. And I'm going to kick it over to her and let her start with some um, insights and advice for families related to routines. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. So when Mrs. When Dr. Newell asked me to do this, I could have written a novel 
So I really tried to keep it more condensed. And I thought about the issues that I'm facing daily with the students that I work with. And so I thought that would be more applicable here. So routines are so important. I'm a routine person. Establishing a daily routine is, is critical in this whole um, at home learning process. Um, some form of calendar, whether it be digital, whether it be, I have one student that's actually doing post-it notes on a daily basis. And every time they finish a particular activity for that day, they'll take their post-it note off, crumple it, and make a basket. And all those little things are ways that they can stay organized with the number of things going on um, in their daily schedule. Um, definitely preparing the night before is important. Uh, it's crucial. I have one young lady who actually showed me this big memo board that she does every evening and it she bullets everything for her Monday that she needs to do or actually for her Tuesday. And that has worked out perfectly for her. I found that the kid, the students that are not as much on top of tasks are scattered. They don't know where to go, what to do, how to do it. So the organization piece is huge. Um, and often just crossing those things off a list shows success, shows that you've accomplished something. So giving those words of affirmation is really <laughs> important for, for any student. Um, when I had shared with you that one of my challenges was organization, I meant it. And then I realized, wow, what is it like for a middle school kid to do that? It's got to be magnified by a thousand. And so that helped me really to be able to spend extra time with my students um, do separate conferences with them to help to help them kind of organize and give them suggestions. And of course, you know, we we know the old limiting distractions, having that cell phone right out by you, um, they're going to go right for it. So limiting those and video games, finding a quiet place. Um, students love to li listen to music when they work. If that's the way they learn, it's OK. Um, but those distractions are huge in, um, in being successful at your at home learning. Awesome, thank you. I uh, I was doing a little show and tell. I have I'm a large. This is a massive sticky notepad, and it makes me so happy every now and then when I do something, um, but it wasn't on the list. I'll add it to the list just for the satisfaction of marking it off. That's a little too much information, but it's really the way I live. All right, talk to us about staying connected. Staying connected is huge. That is something that I have preached and preached and pre preached from day one with um, the AVID kiddos on top of even my ELA kiddos. Um, I would definitely encourage you to have your, your child visit their Google Classroom or any learning management system that has been um, decided upon with their teachers every single day, signing in, see what's going on, if there's any note, any new messages. Definitely staying connected by email is huge because those are our major sources. I know there's some remind 101s as well going on, but definitely staying to get in touch with your with your um, with your teachers and give them a thumbs up. Maybe a small emoji that hey, I'm here, I'm watching, I'm, I'm staying on top of things. Um, another thing that it's really important for parents that I'd like to share is that we love to hear from your from you, but we love 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 hearing from your from your children. Um, and that is a best way just to kind of work on college readiness skills, self-regulating learners, um, problem-solving skills. To give you a one FYI, um, the importance of this, we had one student that um, we couldn't find. We had not heard from this student for, for four weeks. A lot of us um, in sixth grade were kind of concerned. Long story short, fast forwarding. Um, we finally tracked him down. I was able to get in touch with him. I spent an hour on the phone with him, or actually through WebEx, going over his responsibilities. As we're doing that, his circumstances home was that he was watching a one and two year old. So clearly I was able to understand why it is very difficult for him to complete all these assignments, stay organized because he's got all these other tasks at home. That communication was important to bring back to our campus, to his other teachers. So if we don't have, if we don't know that our expectations may be too much, creates more stress, the student may be in, the, in, in a position where he might fail. And so that is very, very crucial in knowing what's going on. I've had parents call me and tell me their, their child are, is feeling a lot of anxiety over this whole thing. They can't get their work done. They don't know how to do. It's been a bad week. And I will say that that's okay. Thank you for letting me know so I understand how I need to or what I need to do 
move forward because the last thing we want on this plate for all of us is to bring any extra or additional stress into our families. Terry, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I know that that, that has been on our minds um, across our educational system for their younger siblings. Daycare centers are closed and other such things. And, and in order for families to earn a living in some cases, they have to get creative with how they manage all of that. Um, but I think it really is, is um, a criti critical observation for you to bring forward that, that that's a middle school student doing that as well. So thank you for definitely pointing that out. Um, all right, and the last part, which you've talked about a little bit, but definitely the importance of being flexible right now. There's no question about this. Um, I had to, I'm pretty type A, and so I had to literally tell myself, let myself off the hook. There are, have been many times that I put an assignment on there, thought these links were working and they did not. There were times that I put something on our Google Classroom that five students came back and said, Mrs. Pop, I don't understand. The beauty of this is that I have those token three students every morning I can count on at 8 a.m. who get on and say, okay, Mrs. Pop, this isn't working. And they actually work with me in problem solving it so that it's, 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 it's working. And so I love that about them. Um, we need to have flexibility, all of us, uh, parents, teachers, students, we're all working together on this. It's a partnership that is very, very important. And I value that, um, the support I get at home, as well as those students that tend to keep me in line. Um, definitely allow for breaks. If you hear your child saying, oh, this is stressing me out, or this is boring, there's probably an underlying frustration going on there. Let them get up and walk away. Um, give them 30 minutes or whatever they need, but let them regroup and then come back to it because bottom line is this is real. This is real learning. So we have to have those expectations. Maybe we need to lessen them one day or maybe, you know, teachers can pull back on a couple of things one week if it's particularly, particularly bad week. But the learning has to happen. So we have to keep that in check, but be very, very sensitive to some of those um, nonverbal and verbal cues that you hear because I, I am sure they'll, real, they'll be real from, from your child. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that because when the brain is in stress mode or emotion mode or there's something really like um, pressing that the brain is worried about, um, they, the brain can't learn. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it is extremely important to walk away, get a drink of water, walk around the house. That's what I did this morning. I didn't have time for a real break, but I literally just walked around my house and it makes me feel so much better just to look and see which flower is blooming right now or to take a minute to get perspective. And I feel like a different person when I walk back to my computer and start working again. Um, so I'm glad you said that. One thing that I also wanted to touch on that you said, I think it was on the last slide, but you were talking about students being self-regulated. And that's one of our portrait of a graduate attributes that we as a district work toward for all of our students in kinder through 12th grade. Um, and if there ever was a chance for us to practice the skill of being self-regulated learners, this um, last few weeks um, has definitely been a case study in that. And I think as, as strange as it is, this one of the silver linings in this whole situation is that um, students probably will be more self-regulated when they go to college and when they go back into the regular um, school building as a result of this, if we can um, sort of train ourselves to have some of those self-regulated patterns um, right now. So I was really glad to, to hear you bring that up. All right, we're going to shift gears now and we're going to hear from Lisa Chain. And I love this quote that you selected as kind of your kickoff um, part of your presentation. So will you talk about that for just a minute? Absolutely. Um, so this was a quote that's been living with me for a long time. I first came in contact with it when I was uh, in graduate school. And so you can see it there, but I'm going to go ahead and read it to you as well. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is because um, what we do as educators is an art and a science. And we spend a lot of time not only studying, but collaborating with others. Um, and we never consider ourselves experts because we're always continuing to learn. Um, and so why I wanted to bring this up is because right now you've been put in a position where you are a kindler. <laughs> That can be very intimidating. And so I want you to know that you really need to show yourself some grace because um, learning 
and our environment is a very social uh, atmosphere. And this is how your kiddos have been conditioned to learn is in a very social environment. And now not only do they not have that, um, the routine is also uh, been changed. And so I just want you to know that please show yourself some grace, even as um, a high school teacher. Um, I live with a high school student and I feel like I'm not really getting that part of what I'm doing right yet. Um, so um, I have to give myself some grace on that. They're just learning in a different way. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that students, just like people, they want to know why they're doing something. So if there's any way that you can kind of connect what they're doing at home in the learning to a bigger picture, whatever that picture is, what classes they want to take in high school if they're in middle school, um, what career they might want to go into, um, or what college they might want to, the more that you can have those discussions beyond the content and really um, put it in a context that they're doing this not to work through a checklist, but because it's building up to a bigger picture, I think kids will buy into it more um, if they know that it's just not about that checklist item. It's about a bigger picture that they're going, uh, that they're trying to achieve. I agree. Thank you for pointing that out and just connecting it to, we have an, one of the golden opportunities we have right now is connections to the quote unquote real world as they watch us pay bills and you know, work through recipes and you know, do adulting and just the connections to the ways they're learning will be a part of all of that. In a few years. All right, let's jump right into um, some of your advice for us. So when kids know why they're doing something, that is really the first step. Why are we doing this? Um, and then it's been my experience both as a mom and also as an AP teacher and as an AVID teacher is that the, the best thing that you can do is put your kiddo in charge of their own learning. Um, and they can't sit down and do that. They're, you know, you have to kind of walk them through that. And that's something that we do, um, you know, as, as college prep teachers and as avid teachers preparing them to do that. Um, so I think um, here's some suggestions on what you might want to do is guide them through coming up with their plan. And so I've listed some things there. And, um, you know, if you can help make a connection to, the, to your kiddos that, you know, if we can get our work done, then that means you have more time to do the things that you really like to do. So kind of brainstorming as a family of all of you doing it around the table together, but individually talking about the things that you like to do and which you would like to spend all your time doing and then sharing that. And then going back to a list and saying, okay, what do I have to do? And how long do I think it's gonna take me to do my have tos? Um, then you can build in a plan of what do I have to do so that I can spend time doing the things that, that I want to do um, with them. Um, when they're do, putting that plan together, because if it's their plan, not your plan, if you're saying you are gonna work from this time to this time and this is gonna be done, then they're not really bought into it. And so if you can get that buy-in with your kids um, and they can take, they can run with it, it will go much, much smoother for you. And um, there won't be that tension necessarily because it's their plan and they own it. Um, when they're going through that, please make sure that they're being pragmatic um, because we all think we can do things quicker than what we actually can. Um, so coaching them through that and then for them to plan breaks. Um, so once they know the why and they have a plan, um, it shouldn't end there um, because you have to ask them, okay, that's your plan. How are you going to hold yourself accountable? Um, and then when they tell you how they're going to go back and review and reflect and see where they are, then they can choose when they're going to check in with you. Um, and then at that point, when you're doing the check-in, um, you can tell them, hey, look at these plans are going to evolve and we, we may have to revise them. Um, and so it's a way of holding them accountable, but they've told you how and when they're going to hold themselves accountable to you. Um, and just know that this is a process that takes a lot of patience, um, both on your part and, and their part in this as well. Um, the process just takes a lot of practice. It takes us four years in high school to get our avid babies ready to leave us, four years. 
<laughs> that they're able to do this on their own. And we're asking them to not only learn at home, but learn a skill to be able to do that. So patience is really kind of key. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And one of the things that I really love there is the bullet that talks about agreeing on how often the parent will do the check-in. Um, because to me, if that is agreed upon um, prior to the work starting, when everybody's calm and nobody's feeling judged or when there's not any other emotional dynamic, um, then when the parent does the check-in, oh, it's just more of a follow-up. I said I was going to do this and there's not any sort of insinuation of a lack of work or anything like that. And it just feels like that as a ground rule gives it um, a much easier entry point to that conversation later in the day or whenever it is. Um, your next slide talks a little bit more about the learning environment. So you want to talk about that for just a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so I think really what I'd like to leave you with this is just to know there's no magic recipe. And Terry touched on this a little bit ago about the, the earbuds. Um, and I know what kind of learner I am. And um, I need quiet. You know, I, I, would, I would look like your quintessential perfect student. That's just good for me. Um, but what I've learned over the years is that does not work for all students. And again, using my son as an example, he does much better when he actually is listening to music, when he's working on math and science and that kind of thing. Um, so there is no magic recipe. Um, and just celebrate that we do have lift different learning styles. Um, I remember, you know, a few years ago, I had a student, one of my AP physics students, and he took a test. Um, and it was the first test and he did okay. I mean, it's AP physics first test and he, you know, he had a high C, low B, which was pretty good. Um, and then as we got to know each other before he took the second test, he came to me and he said, Mr. Chang, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, of course. He says, I really think I would be successful, more successful if you let me stand at the lab, lab table in the back of the room and I could stand and take my test. And I said, okay. And so sure enough, it was a harder test I might add because uh, the second one always is uh, in AP Physics, um, and he had a 90. And so our kids know um, what it takes for them to be successful. And I always feel like if you treat kids like they're an adult until they prove you otherwise, which is my mantra with my kids at school, um, they'll rise to that occasion. So just celebrate um, that it may not look like what you think it should look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing is creating those boundaries. So whatever that workspace is, it does not have to be a room all by themselves with their own desk. It, it does not need to look like that. But what it should have is boundaries. And so what I mean by that is if your workspace, your workspace should be a place that you can kind of close up and you leave. So if the Xbox is in the workspace, that's not good. But by the same token, a calculator should not be at the bedside table either. And so creating those boundaries of where do I work and where do I not work, that helps them kind of compartmentalize and end their day, if you will. Um, and then, you know, try to create a symbol for them of what they're missing, because uh, as Ms. Pop uh, alluded to earlier, they miss uh, their friends. They miss their building um, and they miss us. They really, they really do because that's comforting to them. So maybe a symbol in that area of what that is. So like maybe it's a Mustang if they're a GHS student or a Panther or a wolf or whatever that is, or friends. Um, and then finally, what I would like to, to leave you with, and this is something that I started doing about three weeks ago, um, and it has helped me immensely. And some of my students who I suggested it to have said that it really, helps them too, is to create a ritual for your day. Start your day the same way and end it the same way. Um, so it can look different ways. Um, what I really like to do, and my students have said they really enjoyed it, is at the end of the day to write something that they're grateful for. And that grateful might not be a huge celebration. Maybe it's, you know what, I only um, completed 50% or 25% of my checklist but I'm grateful that I was able to do that because that's the best I could do today. Um, so whatever that is, create a, creating a ritual um, for what your, your learning is gonna look like during the day. Mm, I love that. That's actually been a part of my sanity as well. 
Um, and what I find is that when I don't do it, because there are days that are wonky, um, then I notice it. I notice it in my well-being later in the day. And so I've tried to be as legalistic about that as possible. Um, and one of the things I think you guys both talked about the importance of taking breaks and space boundaries and scheduling and that sort of thing. And, and I'll have to say that one of the silver linings I've seen in my own high school daughter is that she's made time for working out in the middle of the day. She's never done that, right? And she started out the first week and she'd be embarrassed if I if she heard me saying this, um, but, you know, she would go out on a walk or then she would start running And the first week or two. It took her, you know, the whole time to run a mile. Well, she's up to running like almost three miles now um, every morning. And that's just become part of her stress relief. And um, it's just been uh, a reminder to me that there are going to be some cool sort of after effects of this um, because of the things we're learning um, about our own schedules and about our own capabilities that and we didn't know about ourselves before. So um, thank you guys so much. Many, many rich perspectives. Um, I am going to see if there are any questions from Mr. Berger related to the chat box that we need to address. Currently, we don't have any questions in there. I posted in there so everybody can see if you have any questions, put it in the chat for us. Okay, well, what I'll do then is I'll switch it to this next to the last slide. Um, and I told the speakers I'd give them one last opportunity if there were any closing comments they wanted to bring forward because maybe something occurred to them after I spoke or whatever. Um, and then while we're doing that, if, if any questions do arise that would be general to the audience, um, Kyle can watch those. Um, so, our teachers, any final closing words? I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, just let, if it, it's important for your your student for our students to know that we're experiencing some of the same frustrations that they are. So teachers are on the same page as they are. Um, we're all dealing. We're all going through this together. And so always keep that in mind. Sometimes when you when you all are on the same page, it makes it a little easier in a strange sort of way. So we we do understand. You know, we do have families. We do have um, work responsibilities. We do have children. Um, and so uh, if at all it gets to that point, just let your child know that we're going through the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it helps us have empathy for each other, for sure. Sherry, kind of um, going along with that, um, one of my professors um, had this, this great saying, um, and so even though it was to uh, teachers, I'd like to share this with you. And, and her, her saying was, you cannot teach unless they know that you care. So as a parent, just make sure that your relationship with them and they know that you care is the most important thing that's going on. The, the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to diminish the value of the learning that needs to happen. I'm not, please don't mistake that. But that's kind of like the basis of you know Maslow's pyramid okay if your kids feel safe if your kids feel like you care about them um, and not the work that they're doing first um, that's the most important thing awesome that's absolutely so true okay Mr. Berger it looks like we've got some questions coming in now so let's see oh this is a good question um, what would you do for a student who's struggling with ADD issues and um, maybe has a 504 and normal routines don't always work? That, that, that's a challenge. Um, again, it's, it's generally, uh, I would definitely uh, make sure that you are getting your appropriate accommodations based on your 504 through any of the lesson designs. and. All of us are doing that as I know for ELA, we are doing that. We're incorporating that in there. Um, definitely chunking your day, chunking assignments. If, if that works for your child, uh, small things, accomplishment, maybe a break, go back to something else, maybe a break after that. Uh, it just kind of depends on, on your child and works best for them. Uh, always making sure you're positive, positive, positive with every small accomplishment. But I can certainly understand where, in fact, I actually spoke with a young man this morning, believe it or not, over the same thing. He said, Mrs. Pop, uh, I'm, I'm confused. 
Uh, I, I can't, I can't focus. It was clearly that exact conversation we had. And I actually spoke, took an hour with him and we WebEx and we went through everything line by line, what his responsibilities were, how to get to that on his Google Classroom, the links to click. I mean, it was very, very um, specific, labor specific, but it was really worth the time. So reaching out to your teachers uh, is very, very important as well. I, th I think the only, yeah, absolutely. I think your teacher is going to be able to, because your teacher knows your your student very well because they've spent, you know, three quarters of a, a school year together. Um, but one thing, um, and, and talk this over with your kiddo, I would say is, um, you know, with the checklist, there's a checklist for each subject. And so I know I've had a couple of students that said, Mrs. Chain, like Monday has to be my English day. And uh, Tuesday has to be my social studies day. Um, because that that transition between all of those um, uh, classes in one day is difficult for them. Um, and I can understand that because in the school environment, even though they go to those classes all in one day, what they do have when they come into um, the classroom is a pacer. We, we, we set the rhythm for the students and the pace and those check-ins. And now we're asking them to do that for themselves, which they, they, have, they don't have that skill. So maybe talk um, to your kiddo and just say, well, would it be better if we just focus certain subjects on certain days? And that might be helpful. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. And you know, one of the things we kind of forget maybe in a home environment, because we're literally standing in the same physical space all day long, um, but especially at the middle school level where kids change classes every 50 minutes or so, and so they get their movement needs taken care of. I don't have a ton of movement needs typically, but I found myself, I've had to, had to create a standing desk and I have to be able to wiggle a little bit. I actually embarrassingly have some weights, hand weights at my desk so that I can um, just release some energy while I am cooped up in a house all day long. And so I think that, like you said, it is gonna be different from from student to student, but um, but finding the finding the routine that works and not necessarily limiting ourselves to the box that we um, were in in the normal school building. Um, one of the other questions that came in through the chat room was related to um, kids who are juniors in high school and are maybe worried about um, college planning and that sort of thing. Um, I, we, I'm going to kind of push the pause button on that particular topic, but I want parents who are listening to know we have a, a session scheduled and it, I think it's already listed on the Parent University website, but I, and I think it is on May the 7th, but double check me um, when, you, uh, when you get off of this. Um, and it's going to be facilitated by some folks from the high school counseling team. Um, going through information for us. And we also have a website developed by some folks in the Go Center at the high schools that has like, what am I missing now? Sort of college planning and preparation tips. Um, I will actually link that in. We have a, a resource page on slide 13. Um, and I don't have that listed there right now. But before I link this to the website at the end of our show, um, I will link that college planning um, website um, that Ms. McGowan over in the career and tech ed area has built for us. So that can be a resource you see after the fact. All right, Mr. Berger, any other um, questions that um, are needed for the good of the order? That looks like it's it. The last one in uh, was asking if this presentation will be available uh, for others to follow up on. It will. We're going to, um, as you uh, know, you're you're recording it for us. And it usually, like, for instance, on the Tuesday one, it took us um, a little bit less than a day to get everything um, linked and posted up on the website. And so it will be there along with the schedule of parent university sessions. And that list is growing kind of day by day, depending on the feedback we get from the parent survey. Tomorrow's session, just in case anyone's listening and is interested, um, uh, is on the topic of accessibility features for students who have special needs and um, may need help with accessing the learning more effectively on their devices. So we've got a couple of guests speaking to us about that. Generally speaking, for the next few weeks, these sessions are going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but every now and then when we know of another topic that is kind of time sensitive, we're putting it on the schedule 
um, kind of outside of that Tuesday, Thursday routine. So definitely check back the ske on the schedule as often as possible. Um, and more sessions will be added. We'll also be putting them in the general GCISD communications update that um, comes out from the communications department. So hopefully we'll f we're finding a lot of people, but definitely if you're listening to this and you know that there are friends or neighbors or colleagues who would benefit from this, we'd be more than happy to have them join in. It's not um, a GCISD specific resource per se. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Great job, wonderful feedback from the group. And we will see y'all again next time with our Learning at Home University. Bye. Thank you.